Okay. Hello, everyone. I think we're in a good position to start now. Um, so for those of you who um, don't know who I am, I'm Abby and I'm the People Operations Generalist. Um, I'm part of the People Operations team. And this session is on uh, decision making and I'm going to be presenting the kind of first part and then I'll be passing it over to Barbie um, in the second half. So um, I want to um, start off by um, getting you to think about a couple of things. Um, one of them is in preparation for when we open this up to discussion. I'm going to be talking in the abstract for a little bit. I'm going to go to the handbook um, first and then um, giving you a bit more sort of tips and guidance on how to make um, decisions. Then I'm going to pause and pass it over to um, Barbie to talk about um, we Sid very kindly gave us gave the people operations team a link to rework with Google and um, for those of you who might not be familiar um, this is a project or an effort by Google and others to help share and push forward the practice and research of data driven HR and they've opened up um, a lot of case studies and resources for um, lots of different topics and one of them is for new managers so there was some content in there on decision making and i've added um, a few slides from that to this presentation um, some of the other points that they've shared will include in some further training and add to the handbook um, of course some of it may or may not be relevant um, to gitlab but it's really good um, reference material for us um, after that, we'll be opening it up to discussion. So going back to this think about slide, um, I'd like you all to think about why decisions are hard to make, first of all, what's made them difficult, and what steps you've gone through um, to make decisions, and how opposing views were handled um, if you came across um, any. So that's something I'd like you to think about as we go through this, and then we'll come back to this um, at the end. So, as always, um, when I prepare these sessions, I go to the handbook and take a look at what we already have. Um, and I went to the leadership page and I saw um, that there were a few points on um, decision making. And I kind of want to take a bit of a step back and say that I think not just managers, but everyone at GitLab um, has the freedom to make decisions basically because there are different types of decisions and I'll put them into three kind of buckets of um, tactical, operational or strategic. So that kind of covers um, pretty much everybody, I think, at GitLab. Um, and I was really looking for what, if I was a new manager and I wasn't clear on, you know, how do we go about making decisions, where would I go? And what's the kind of guiding principles behind um, decision making? So of course I went to the handbook and I created this, this section here, making decisions and added what we already have in the handbook and added a couple of other points. Um, so I think the general uh, approach to this is that um, we make decisions based on an informed and knowledgeable hierarchy. Um, and that's also, um, in addition to that, I've added, um, Data, we should be making data-driven um, decisions. I think we all love data, um, mainly because it helps provide powerful and useful insights that support the decision-making process. In addition to that, um, I think you can't go wrong with subject matter e experts, depending on whatever it is that you need to make a decision on or about. Um, and you should refer to them if you know who they are and reach out to them for their um, insight and input. Um, another point with this is that the person that does the work makes the decisions, but um, I think you should, that person will probably come to you um, as their manager for your advice or approval. And if that is the case, then you should be asking them for data. What data have they gathered? What are their recommendations? What do they think is the best approach? But um, 
the point with that is that if you are the decision maker, you shouldn't really do it in isolation. So gathering data, getting insights, testing things out, um, perhaps, but um, we're not looking for consensus um, when it comes to voting on material decisions. So does anybody have any additional thoughts on this in the handbook so far? Silence. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> I'll go back. Um, so this is, this is kind of like the, the guiding principles um, of making decisions at GitLab, which I think is a great start. And I think, um, as with everything, we can iterate further on this. And I would really appreciate um, your help um, with doing that as managers as well, and people who make um, probably more decisions um, than I do in my role. Um, so from that, I went um, and did a little bit of research into, okay, well, we have our the GitLab approach, but what are the key points in how to make a decision? So um, I found a really great article, and I've linked it at the bottom there, which kind of listed out um, six tips on how to make decisions. And I want to walk through some of those. Because as I said, as managers, you may be asked for your approval on making the decision but someone else will probably execute it. Um, and you should be sure that you have all or as much information as possible um, before acting. So I think the first step um, when you're faced with making a decision is to analyze the situation. So you can ask yourself, who will the decision impact? And what data, information or knowledge do you have or need? And at this point, depending on what it is, your gut instincts may start to kick in. You may think, hmm, this seems to feel right to me if we do this or do that. Um, and you may have already put your mind um, in one direction. I don't think you should necessarily switch that off. I think it can help. But at the same time, you should be able to back up um, your instincts with data and information. So um, the next step as I said, is to look at gathering data, and that could be raw data, um, numbers, things like that, or information, or knowledge um, from other people within GitLab. Um, as I mentioned, subject matter experts, and we'll talk um, a bit deeper about how to get information like that from other people um, in the second part. Um, there are two things I think you should consider with that, um, when you're getting information from others, is the credibility of that person. What's their track record? Have they been successful um, in the area um, that you're looking to get the information from? Do they have any biases against a particular direction um, of the decision? And um, do you think about your biases um, in terms of what you want to do or what decision that you need to make? Um, another point, is it the right thing to do? Um, this was kind of interesting um, as I was reading the article, because there are many areas where compromise yields significant benefits, but your value system, your character and your integrity should never be compromised. Um, and the other point, which seems kind of obvious, is to actually make the decision. You should have a bias towards action and be willing um, to make the decision. And you should, um, of course, make the best decision possible, even if you possess an incomplete data set. I guess probably a little bit of word of caution there. It depends on, again, who the decision is going to impact, what it's going to impact. Have you done um, a cost and benefit analysis, assess the risk reward ratio, and if you've done all those things, um, then you can feel confident um, about making the decision. Um, the other point, have a backup plan. Um, decision makers are people and people make mistakes. So therefore, sometimes wrong decisions will happen. And the secret is to understand all plans are made up of both constants and variables. And sometimes variables work against you. Um, 
any questions or thoughts on what I've talked about so far? One, I, I have one thing, which is one of the common kind of failure modes I see here is what my, my dad used to call analysis paralysis. Um, meaning people, they follow each one of these steps, um, but the process can kind of go on forever and go on to the point where you miss an opportunity. Um, so are there tips or tricks we can use or we can teach uh, our, our uh, managers that we work with or, or people that are making decisions to um, learn how to value time um, and, and be comfortable, you know, getting into that, you know, 70% range of certainty and pulling the trigger versus waiting too long and waiting until it's perfect. I think for me, it's really about ba balancing out the risks of a wrong decision. There's going to be times where a wrong decision is not catastrophic and you can take more risk. And then there's going to be times where um, being wrong could be catastrophic and then you want to be more careful and deliberate. And I think that it's not the same for every situation and it's really about balancing those out and being thoughtful about it. But I agree with you, especially in an iterative environment like we have at GitLab, we should be able to make decisions fairly quickly and, uh, and then move forward or unwind if we need to unwind. But, you know, there's some decisions we may make that there's no way to unwind and there really is no back, backup plan that could ensure that the catastrophe doesn't occur. So um, hopefully those are more rare situations, but where they are, you should, you should very tread very carefully. How do you know if you execute it 70%? How do you know that you're spending 10 more percent uh, of time or 10 more percent to get to 80% doesn't actually get you to, um, to a point where um, um, you have to redo everything from scratch. Like I, I that's that's the part, uh, Eric. You mentioned like um, ex, uh, like trigger, make a trigger at seventy percent already. Let's use that number. Like, where do you understand that that seventy percent is actually seventy percent and not, um, you know, um, something that will make you go back and then redo everything. Um, instead, if you just spend that little bit more extra time to think things through, uh, to get to 80% and then uh, execute. I think um, for, Barbie's right, for uh, in an iterative environment, making smaller decisions is a, is a natural defense against this. And then there's some things, and we have a couple of these projects ongoing right now on the engineering side. One is the GCP migration, one is the, the GEO project where we have to take a longer view than normal. And it's not just a month iteration. Uh, and we, we have to do a little bit of kind of time management. So we're doing uh, a little bit of, you know, light Gantt charting basically. And I know that like, we're not using Microsoft project. We're not gonna maintain this thing, but just as an initial plan, we're just looking at dependencies and where the timeline comes out. Um, and we're using that as a forcing function to say, okay, you know, as, as Sid mentioned in the call this morning, there is time pressure around geo in particular due to the, the ACV. Um, and what that means is that we have an opportunity here to um, assume that time is fixed, assume that the scope is fixed, and then see what that does to the resources required to, um, uh, to execute it. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, in, in databases, like, you know, cap theorem, it's like pick two. It's, it's sort of the same type of exercise here. We model it and, and depending on what you're optimizing for, um, something happens to the to the to the third input. Um, and then there might be other situations, and maybe this is more in the sales sort of thing, where when you're dealing with external customers and you're dealing with, um, you know, uh, quarters and you're dealing with fiscal years and things like that, there are triggers that those individuals have to understand. Like if I don't get this contract done by a certain point in time, my champion in the organization is going to lose the lose the budget. And that's usually not the case in engineering decisions, but it's, there's, there's other types of organizations that, that probably have to model for those or optimize for those sort of uh, things. Can I, uh, can I add to that? Um, yesterday I uh, made some popcorn and it says on the box that uh, you should stop, um, stop the microwave when the time between pops is two seconds. And that two seconds is pretty arbitrary. So, um, as Eric said, you should see for every decision, is it like what's, is it reversible? Is this like a one-way door or is it a two-way door? Now, so the time is variable, but 
the time between pops is like the time where you have a new insight. So if you, if you talk to people and you keep having new insights, you keep learning, apparently there's value and keep going. If, it's, if you keep hearing the same things, then apparently it's time to make the decision. Now, how long the time is depends on the impact of the decision. I'll take a, talk a bit more about that in slide 10, but, uh, but, but that's a criteria I use. Abby, are you going to continue or what's the plan? I'm sorry. Sorry. I, uh, I thought oh, I'd unmute sorry. myself. I I, yeah, I was talking and I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Two sorry. people talking, but both muted. Did yeah, it really sorry. happen? <laughs> if it's yeah. Muted? So, uh, yeah, we'll move on on the slides. But uh, I was going to say that you guys are all right. And uh, not all decisions can you break up into smaller parts. But when you can break them up into smaller parts and then learn at each, at each milestone, that's an excellent way of doing it. Uh, but they will all be different. They will, some decisions can be made in five minutes and they can be good decisions. Other decisions take more time. And, and it's really about learning to trust your gut and to get the data and to ask the right questions. But let's move forward a little bit into that. Um, I think Abby gave me control on these slides, but um, let me see here. Yes, there we go. So balancing advocacy, inquiry, inquiry and summary is, is a little bit about what you're asking about here. And so we do have some slides that talk a bit about that. So when you're making decisions there's certain data points there's reasonings you need to get but you also need to often have an opinion most of the times we're making a decision to go somewhere it's almost like you've got a theorem that you're going to test and you and you want to put into place and so there's a little bit of advocacy that goes into this too so you do need to state your views clearly you need to understand what it is you want and hope to get from this decision that you're making while still being open to influence so be explicit about the reason why you want to make the decision, what you hope to accomplish, your concerns, your conclusions, your reasoning. Offer up the examples and the data that you do have that would lead towards this decision being made, being adopted, people getting buy-in. It is your decision, but it's a good idea to bring people along with you because in most situations we're not in this world alone and it's good to have people on our side and helping us to execute and uh and then you need to make your points one at a time i think often we we kind of spew out a lot of information and it's hard for people to track and follow but again you need to be open to influence and when you're open to influence and getting data and opinions and expertise from others that brings you into inquiry and with inquiry, you do need to explore other people's reasonings, concerns, and interests. You need to encourage them to challenge you and ask you questions. It is invaluable to have people challenge your assumptions and challenge your assertions because it does make you think through your reasoning, think through your thoughts, think through where you want to go. Are you correct in your assumptions? Are you correct in your reasonings? And sometimes when you just self-reflect, that really improves you to feel more solid with your reasoning and know, yes, this is the direction I want to go. And you can feel more firm with that when you are challenged and are able to respond to those challenges in a way that is logical, does make sense. And it, so it really does allow you to test your own understanding. And it also makes those that you're working with feel like their opinions, their expertise have been taken into consideration. But to Abby's earlier point, who, 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 who is the expert and, and who does have the right data? So you do have to be thoughtful and, and discriminatory about which opinions you listen to. Everyone's got an opinion, but not everyone's an expert in a lot of things. And so it's figuring out who are the, who are the experts that you should go to and who you should seek information from. It's not to say that the rookie can't have great ideas. There's a lot we can learn from rookies because sometimes they ask the best questions but uh, do know who your rookies are and who your experts are. So, and then it's about balancing the advocacy, the inquiry with actually summarizing and making the decision. And so it's great to synthesize the views you've heard in your own words, test your understanding of others' concerns and capture the full meaning of the situation. And then hopefully you can make a decision and not only make a decision, but make a decision that others understand. Often when we make decisions, they are controversial decisions. And if those impacted by our decisions feel like we took their time to understand their situation, 
they can get much more behind the decision. Even if they don't like it, they can understand the reason why, and that's invaluable to getting success in what you want to execute. Now, Sid has also added a slide here. So we can stop and ask for questions now, or Sid, do you want to go ahead and move on to your slide? Up to you. Do, are there any questions right now? All right, let's go to Sid. So I was in an uh, airplane, uh, and this was really at the start of my career, was talking to someone in the oil and gas industry. I think it was a quality inspector. And he says, well, it's simple. Well, it's simple. He had to take a lot of decisions. And he says, oh, every time I make a decision, I ask myself, do I make a decision of the right size at the right time based on data? So the right size is like, can we, can we make the decision smaller? Can we iterate? Can we make it a two-way door where we make the decision but have the optionality of going back on it? Every time you can do that, it makes it a lot easier to make the decision. The popcorn time goes from like days to like minutes because you can take the decision. If you were wrong, you'll find out and you can go back. Um, the right time, when do you need to make it? Now, on one hand, a company evolves by the velocity of its decisions. So I try to decide really, really fast for most. I think of myself as like decision machine. I said something, but I'll come up with a decision. Might be right, might be wrong, but it's, it's not, it's the velocity of decisions and the clarity that they give is more important than being right. Um, yeah, should, how should we name that? I'll come up with something. It's got to be a unique name. We've got to agree on the name. We couldn't have two names. Two, having two names for the same thing is horrible. Like, like that, that would, that would be the bad thing. So, so it doesn't matter what we call it. Call it something. I, now, I think Bayes' theorem is actually a really good representation of this, where you have a model and you're continually improving it with data. Uh, that might be a little bit too for, formal and mathematical for people, but I usually think of those things about Bayesian statistics. Yep. Well, Eric, ask Barbie for edit access. You, you still have time to add a slide. Um, now, the second thing is the right time. When do we need? Uh, oh, well, I, I talked about needing to decide fast. Now, there are one way doors. And for most of them, you know it's a big decision. You know it's important, and there's pressure to decide now. And it's surprising to me how frequently, when you think about it, you can delay the decision. Many times you have to take an action, but you don't have to make the decision yet. You can just keep going and gather more information. And it's frequently with these big things that are urgent, so important and urgent, that people tend to freak out and make a decision when they shouldn't. They should preserve all their options and just keep going. And this happens a lot in enterprise, in partnerships and fundraising, in many of these cases, you actually don't have to decide at that time. And, and it gives you all kinds of optionality. So where I say of small decisions, people tend, tend to take too long for them. Big urgent decisions, people tend to decide too fast, or at least people meet. Uh, so so the, the, the intuition is kind of wrong. Now the last part, based on data. Very, 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 very important. Um, you, you, you're a leader because of, of the legitimacy in other people's eyes. If they don't know what you base your decisions on, you're going to lose that legitimacy. You seem arbitrary. Um, and it's hard because it takes time. So I don't, I'm not pretending I always do a good job of this myself. But anytime you can get data, that's great. And it starts with like asking other people, what do you think we should do? Doesn't really matter. That answer matters less than the follow-up question. Why do you think that? What are the other factors we should weigh? Getting all that data on the table is, is the most important thing. It, it, it allows everyone to contribute. It allows everyone to feel heard. Uh, that builds understanding. But most important, you have all the data. Uh, and Almost every time I talked to Andrew yesterday and I was like, shouldn't we, I thought we made our a fork of LipKit's um, Go implementation, shouldn't we do this or that? And turns out I was wrong. We 
we're selling out directly. So many times you you have a flawed assumption somewhere and it greatly simplifies the decision making. And I wanted to put the, this thing in there, uh, this, this graphic, if we have data, let's look at the data. If we have a, our opinions, let's go with mine. You kind of want to avoid that situation. So I probably should put a red arrow across it. Um, anytime you can have a data driven decision, it's better. And I believe most of them uh, have data and uh, it makes many times when we have decisions that feel, that feel opaque, like should we invest more in solving technical debt or not? Um, many times when you get it from an abstract level to like an example level, it becomes a lot clearer. Should we fix that thing? Yes or no. It, it, it makes it a lot easier to reason about it. Um, I added another slide, slide 11, uh, who should make a decision? Um, I try to say more and more, I don't have an opinion. And it feels kind of like a cop out, uh, but it's powerful. It empowers other people. I also try to say more, since you accurately summarize all data, I'll leave the decision up to you. Like we should get all the data on the table and then it's up to you to decide. And there's a big benefit to having the person that does the work make the decision because they have to live with the consequences of that. And it's so annoying that someone else decides something other than you wanted to do. And now you have to execute on that. So I'm not always good at practicing what I'm preaching right now. I try to become, I think over time I'm becoming better at it, but, but these are a few things that I wanted to, uh, wanted to share. Um, I think that opens it up for discussion. Um, on the on your last point, Sid, there about about empowering people who are doing the work to make decisions. This is something I'm I'm super passionate about, and I think when I interviewed, I talked to a lot of people about this. Like, you know, how do you motivate engineers? And there's this really cool talk. It's it's fairly well known. Um, uh, it's based on a, a book by um, Dan Pink called Drive. There's a, a YouTube video by RS Animate about Drive, and it's basically what motivates knowledge workers. They did this really cool, I, I like this because it sounds like business school jargon, but it's actually based on an empirical study done at MIT. And they, uh, they wanted to figure this out. So they took MIT undergrads and they had them turn a crank as hard as they could as a proxy for physical labor. And then they had them do some like calculus as a proxy for knowledge work. And then they gave them arbitrary mo money rewards, you know, five, 10, $20 for this stuff. And they saw a linear correlation between how much money they gave people and how hard they turned the crank for physical labor. So it turns out if you want more physical labor, you just pay people more. And strangely enough, they saw an inverse relationship uh, with monetary rewards and the knowledge work, which was just puzzling. And they ended the study and they said, this is crazy, we need to do some follow-ups. And what they ended up coming up with is this model called um, mastery, autonomy, and purpose are the things that motivate knowledge work. And this is why people will work a job all day and then stay up all night committing to the Linux kernel for no money. Um, it's because one of these three things is sort of intrinsically motivating them. And mastery is, the idea that you have the chance to be the absolute best at something in the world. Um, purpose is the idea that you can connect uh, the small individual tasks that you're doing to larger grand visions. And then autonomy is exactly the point that you described, which is knowledge workers need to have a say in how things are being done when they're going to do them or they find it intrinsically demotivating. So I always look for opportunities to create all three of those especially the autonomy piece because I'm in management and I, and I try to enable people to make those decisions and not take that away from them because you see um, uh, dates slip, you see poor quality work, um, the more you tell people exactly how to do stuff. So try to focus on the, on the what and then leave the how to the, to the people who have their hands in the technology. Obviously, Eric, this is very useful data for our next salary negotiation with, uh, with you. Uh, <laughs> I will remember that inverse relationship. Um, the, um, so I agree with Eric. Um, I, I do think that most of the literature that, that as far as I I've, I've could see is that what people want most in a job and what keeps them motivated in a job is a sense of progress. Um, so it's, it's very important um, 
to to have progress and i think decisions frequently are pro progress like they unblock you for something and counterintuitively like reversing a decision is really bad like when 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 a decision hasn't taken effect yet and i'm reversing it like like undoing work like it's horrible for your sense of progress so if you can make it smaller you can at least like make a decision go there maybe it turns out what's the wrong decision you go back that's 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 okay but if you kind of say go left and then even before you went down the road and figured out whether it was any good you say go right that's very annoying um and and the the way to reduce that is just to keep like work in progress low like like what we try to do iterate make smaller decisions do smaller projects so you have to cancel fewer of them you have it's less frequently that you have to take people off something and put them on something else um to totally agree and uh, and when and sometimes we have to do it and it's always a bit of a bummer but um it's really important for for people in leadership positions to be to acknowledge that switching cost that that people have to pay especially engineers who love to automate stuff and then we have to throw something away um so just acknowledge that hey we made a decision we're reversing it i acknowledge that that's on me i'm asking you to come with me as we make this turn and and make sure people feel that the decision wasn't arbitrary or they weren't uh, weren't included because it it can be totally demotivating Yeah, I think with any decision you make, explain to your stakeholders and those impacted the why and the context around it is always super important, whether it's making a decision or unwinding the decision, the why is always critical. Okay, I'd like to open it up um, and find out about some real examples of um, perhaps difficult decisions um, that some of you have had to make. So I'll pass it over to, yeah, Barbie, I'll ask you. Um, perhaps you can give us an example. Well, gosh, there's so many of them. <laughs> so I think probably um, the most, one of the most recent ones was joining GitLab. Uh, I had a, a successful consulting career and I needed to make the decision on whether or not I will join GitLab or not. And I really did go through the, um, the deliberations of the facts versus the emotions and, and lining up numbers and then the emotions of what do I think I would enjoy most. And I think that I just had to really deliberate amongst those and then ask those around me who know me and know what drives me and knows, know what makes me happy as well as looking at all the data and then it was the decision to join and it was one of those decisions that isn't um possible to be catastrophic there was no necessarily wrong or right one in terms of of leading to some huge failure but uh so it made it a little bit i guess easier to make but um I didn't really have any opposing views. Everyone that I spoke to was very, very supportive and agreed with my passion and my energy around joining. So I didn't really have to um, explain myself as much as I would in a more controversial decision. I think it was, it was widely understood by everyone who knows me that of course I'd want to do this. So from that perspective, I didn't have to go there. Unfortunately, though, I do have Comcast here who's going to disconnect my internet now. <laughs> it won't be up for about another 20 minutes, so I am going to have to hop off. <laughs> Thank you. Guys. Thanks. Thanks, Marvin. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> okay, um, I'd like to hear from somebody else. What about you, Sarah? Can you talk about an example of a difficult decision and specifically? I would be interested to know how you handled opposing views. You would do this to me today, Abby. <laughs> uh, as you can imagine, in UX, there's a lot of times there are, are opposing views. And uh, unfortunately, we don't always have the, the, the data to back it up, right? I mean, we're working on getting more of that data and, and being able to, to back those things up. Um, but a lot of times it is really... Um, more of getting a full view of the problem, hearing all sides uh, in terms of what 
the proposed solution is, and, and then really just doing your best to move it forward. So um, I also find that a lot of times on UX issues, they, um, t there tends to be a lot more discussion because there is a lot of opinion um, and not necessarily opinion based on, on any type of data, really just more about, well, I think this and I think that. So as much as I can, I try to cut to the meat of the issue. So what is the problem we're trying to solve? What are the proposed solutions? What data do we have, if we have any? And then how can we take a step forward as quickly as possible and, and, and then collect data to say, yes, this was the right decision or, or no, this was the wrong decision. So I don't, I don't necessarily have a specific example in mind, but um, that's what I try to do anytime I enter into these, these issues and these conversations. Um, and I think where it becomes difficult for me sometimes is when I state a decision, this is the decision we've made on this issue, this is what we're going to do going forward, make it UX ready, and then a lot of times what happens is other people will come in, oh, well, I didn't know about this issue, I have this opinion, wait, 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 and then you kind of get pulled back, sucked back into that, that decision. But something Sid said really resonated with me in terms of, of how we handle user research. When you get to the point where everyone is saying kind of the same thing, it's time to move on. Like, you're not gaining anything from continuing to have that conversation. You need to take what you've learned from that conversation, implement it, and then start a new conversation. Um, and that's what we do with user research and testing. Once everyone is kind of giving us the same feedback, we know where we're at, what we need to do, and then we can move from there. So, and sorry if that was a little rambling. I just, you caught me by surprise, Abby. Um, yeah, I love that, Sarah. And I think what you're referring to as data is what I would call hard data. Um, for, I think it's really commendable that we're doing so much user research and like new project page with like per second timings now of, of what is faster. That's amazing. That's hard data. Most of the decisions I make are based on soft data. So I count opinions as like soft data. At least we got the opinion of someone. It's not just my own. So, so my data, my data that I refer to is like frequently just gathering all the opinions of the people in the room instead of instead of having having a, an Excel model or something like that. Um, so, um, take that gathering data in in that vein, and I think if you have all the opinions, it's it should be the person who's most yeah, both most expert in the subject matter and the person uh, executing on it, hopefully the same person making, making a call. Uh, so when I say make a decision based on data, I don't mean have an Excel sheet for every decision. I just mean get all the opinions of, of the people that could be, uh, could be helpful. Um, but yeah, obviously if you can get harder data, it, it makes the decision a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I agreed. Yeah, and that, that's what I meant really was, um, you know, there's, there's that hard data, which is hard to always have uh, ready and available and that we're working on. But a lot of times it is really just getting opinions and, and different perspectives and point of view. Because to me, that is data, you know, your experience and what your day to day flow is and how that affects you. That's data I don't have because I don't have that flow and that experience. So trying to have that empathy. Exactly. Okay, I'm not going to pick on anyone, but does anybody want to um, share anything else? I can see you all sitting there nervously looking at me. <laughs> yeah, I, I will share a classic engineering problem where you need to make a decision, in my opinion, and I had it a couple of times in the past. So you are tackling a technical problem and especially more junior engineers tend to do like let's rewrite everything, let's redefine the wheel and start completely from scratch because we just took a very small wrong turn um, and I think it's also most of the time about doing pragmatic choices. Uh, the, the hardest time I had in the past to, to do actual hard decisions was when you had basically two types of opinions but your personal opinion and your personal experience was something different of these two opinions. So basically one, one group said yeah let's redo everything, the other group said yeah let's uh, use uh, redo it but with a complete different library and you were like yeah let's take a step-by-step -step approach so these are the actually really hard decisions for me but i totally reason it and that's one of the biggest things that why i joined gitlab and, and left my old job is 
that there were so many decisions made by simple people who were just reading something and were never close to the topic. And, and, and having the person that actually on a daily basis is there and next to the topic uh, uh, is the most valuable data, soft data, as you said, that you can get. And, and most of the time, uh, that they can make the best decision. But you simply need to, to do this uh, long-term goal also, taking a look at, at longer-term goals because they are like totally in their topic at the moment. Uh, and these are also different things I, I, I tend to take into my decision making. So maybe I, I, I could say a few words uh, because I, I, we all have these engineering challenges that Tim mentioned and like Something that we are often having problem is with like the evolving requirements. Requirements that we think that they are uh, clear in the beginning, but they basically change. And like with our vision, we we maybe know what is the end goal, but we may, may not know the steps to get to this end goal. And something that I've been seeing and I've been part in number of times is like the conflicting opinions how we should do things and like people having their vision about how like some parts should be implemented, uh, how they uh, should look architecturally, what we should maybe prepare, or like maybe sometimes even over engineer. And something that, that kind of very often, uh, not really like very often, very often is the wrong word. Something that I've kind of learned is like that, for me the best way on like making and concluding what we want to do next is like, making sure that we lay out all possible options, make sure that we discuss the implications of all possible options and try to find a solution that would everyone would be comfortable with. Uh, I, it's like I'm trying to find a solution that people uh, are fine with implementing rather than being forced to implement because of like my vision of how they're done. But this is also, this is also not always kind of possible because some people just basically back off at some point, but this decision still has to be made. Uh, so we always think about not only how to implement something, but also what are the consequences if what we make the, as the decision is basically turn us wrong and what is our backup plan. And it's so far it turns out that we made a few bad decisions, but just because we kind of anticipated that this decision may be wrong, we also uh, were able to later correct that. Uh, but just because we work uh, uh, collaboratively on figuring out the best solution that everyone is comfortable with, uh, it did help in like making everyone on the same page. The one thing I just wanted to add um, is that whether or not you make the right decision or the wrong decision or whatever decision you're coming to, um, people really, really enjoy being part of the conversation. And I think when, when you're in a group and a decision has been made that didn't involve you, I think people really um, want to be part of the decision and they're more likely to be on your side if they were part of the conversation. There's that, I think, it's called the Ben Franklin effect, which is like, if someone does a favor for you, they're more likely to do another favor for you in the future. I think that's how it goes, something like that. But people just wanna be involved and people wanna feel that they are important and uh, those types of things. So that's what I try when I'm making decisions, I try and make sure that as many people are involved as possible so that when the decision has been made, someone's not like, hey, I didn't even know we were making that decision. I think people take that more, personally than, uh, than, than we know. Yeah, Jacob, I, I hope that what we can do is create a culture where we debate passionately and we hear everybody out and we listen to people's opinions, but then we can also commit because there's always going to be a quote unquote loser, someone whose decision wasn't the chosen option, not that I like the label loser. Um, and we, we need to train everybody to be comfortable with the idea that, okay, I, I said my piece, I was heard, other people heard me, um, but then I'm comfortable moving forward because time is of the essence. And again, as long as they're making smaller decisions, those people should be comfortable that, okay, if, 
if, uh, if I'm right and we've made the wrong decision, we're gonna find out as quickly as possible and it will be obvious to everybody and we can course correct. Um, in the interest of, of time, um, I, I think that's, that's super important. Yeah, and I think and one of our, the things listed on our values page is disagree and commit. And maybe we can be, go to the previous slide. Um, I think the last sentence there, it's really important to make people hurt. So everyone can chime in, but make them feel hurt and do that by restating their position better than they did themselves. So formally, don't, don't attack a straw man. Don't take the weakest part of their argument and start arguing with that. Instead, give, give the strongest possible case they made and, and, and even, even make it stronger and then disagree with that. And, and in code reviews, we say, you are not your work. You are not your code. And also, you're not your decision. So the, by advocating a certain decision, it, you should be able to untie that from, from, your, from a personal attack. It's not attacking your decision. You're not a loser. You're, the point you advocated for lost. You didn't lose. Um, and that's, that's a completely different thing. Two other things I wanted to add, which are just above that. Managing up, when a decision needs to be taken, if your manager is involved, give them options and trade-offs. Don't just say, look, I recommend this. No, say, look, I recommend this because X, Y, C. If we do this, it would be better in this way and worse in that way. And then managing down, give data and insights. We had an infrastructure meeting this morning and that was, there was a conversation about uh, our geo cluster where there a geo test bed to add one file server or multiple ones. And I thought that the trade off that was done was strange, but I, I, rec I, I realized, look, I haven't given them all the data. So I said, look, we're, our customers need geo to be generally available this bad. And, and that's why, that's why we probably should improve the test bed a bit faster. And I realized like, oops, that's information I haven't given the rest of the company. So I went on the team call and told everyone like, look, this is, this is a very important thing we can do to help with sales. Um, many times people are missing part of the picture that the higher, if you're higher up, you, you have. So it's your role to, to give that information, not, not to take the decision, but to give them the information so they would come to the same conclusion themselves. So give them the data. Okay, we have two minutes left. Is there anything else? Any questions anybody has? Anything else that they want to say? I, I don't see the recording button on, uh, Abby. Uh, it's on my... I see it on. Yeah, it okay, is. Cool. It is I'm on, yeah. Glad, glad to hear that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it scared me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be great. All this good stuff and it's not recorded. Um, yeah, anything else from anybody before we wrap this up? No. <laughs>